Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 270 of Real Blend, a podcast that features brand new friend of the show, Christopher Nolan. On this <laughs> week's show, we are reviewing Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, part one, and our guest, returning to the show one more time, is Christopher Nolan to talk about his new film, Oppenheimer, which we were able to see in uh, 70, mil- uh, 70 millimeter IMAX in New York's Lincoln Square. Is that what Lincoln it is? Center. Lincoln Center. Lincoln Square. Oh. No, it's AMC Lincoln Square. Bah! See? Take that, Jake. It's Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. How are you, sir? Sorry, you're, I guess you're just better with locations than you are celebrity names. That's, that is absolutely <laughs> true. Um, and the man who is still with us, he has not imploded uh, just yet. He will continue to tell us if it happens, even though it is it is locked and done. Uh, he'll tell us it hasn't happened yet. That is Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. And, and good afternoon, gentlemen, Jacob, Jonathan and Gabriel. And uh, just just to stress the importance of of what Sean just said about seeing it in 70 millimeter IMAX. If anyone's listening to this show uh, and you want to know where to find an IMAX that will present the film either in 70 millimeter IMAX or give you the one four three aspect ratio, which is the ratio that the general film was shot in um, tweet me uh, at Kevin McCarthy TV. I will look up your zip code. I've done this for all of Nolan's movies. I love that you do this. I did it for interstellar. I did it. For, I, did it for Dun- I did it for Dunkirk. And yeah. so basically what I would do is I would go on TV and I would say this and I would get hundreds of, of replies. <laughs> so and great. I had I had people that drove eight plus hours from their city to another city just to see a Nolan film. And that one four three aspect ratio is very rare. There's not a lot of theaters in the country. That How can many play theaters that do way. you know? I want to say it's around 30. OK, um, that, that's that's why I kind of wanted to joke like like if you want to know if there's a, you know, a, a 70 millimeter IMAX near you, there's probably not. All right. Um, I want to tease a couple of different things. One, as a reminder, we are definitely reviewing Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One. Following the Nolan interview, we are going to do a quick non spoiler reaction to it. And we're going to get into spoilers as well, too. Um, we're also going to, uh, a- as we mentioned, throw to the Christopher Nolan interview in a hot second. But when we come out of that, we're going to share some stories about what happened the day of and the day before, Um, because you guys like the behind the scenes junket stories. And dang, this is a really good one. (laughs) This is a really good one, especially because it all worked out the way that it did. Um, If you're watching us on YouTube. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. We get filmmakers like, believe it or not, Christopher Nolan, Greta Gerwig, um, you know, your top favorite filmmakers are swinging by Real Blend to talk about their films. So make sure you go over to YouTube.com backslash Real Blend podcast. Give us a subscribe uh, and leave comments down below. Last week, I loved that everybody was giving us their top five of the year for 2023. A bunch of movies that were recommended by uh, people that I absolutely can't wait to catch up with. I saw a lot of love for Air, Dying to see Air um, right now. You I still haven't seen watch, Air? Dude, I can only watch Bruce Willis movies right now. August 1st. August 1st. Starting on wow. August 2nd, I'm going to watch everything I haven't seen up until this point, but literally last night, I think we watched. Um, uh, oh, we started watching something called The First Deadly Sin, which is a 1980 film with Frank Sinatra and Faye Dunaway. And it's Bruce Willis's feature film debut. And he plays an extra walking past Frank Sinatra in the background. just wearing a hat. He has no <laughs> he has no line of dialogue, but that's how that's how comprehensive this book is going to be, baby. Damn. I watched it. <laughs> I saw it. it is free on the YouTube. Uh, Kev, you had a question. I'm sorry about that. Well, no, I just want to say, because I know that there might be new people who are finding our show because of the Chris Nolan interview. You know, Sean, you know, humbly said Greta Gerwig and Christopher Nolan, which are obviously two big guests. And we're going to have Greta Gerwig on the show next week for Barbie. Um, But I do got to say, if you're just finding us, we've had Tarantino on four times, Sir Ridley Scott, Patty Jenkins. Chad Stelhesky, David Leach. I mean, you guys help me out here. I mean, we Hans Zimmer, Zimmer, Ryan Johnson, Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer, Hans Zimmer Ryan Denis Johnson. Love. Yeah. Tom, Tom Hanks, Sir Joaquin Ridley. Phoenix. Yeah. Tom Hanks yep. has been on twice. <laughs> Denis Villeneuve for the first Dune movie. Uh, if you're finding us, please go back in our back catalog. It's a ton of filmmakers that you probably love if you're finding Joe us Kaczynski for the first time. For, uh, Maverick, Top which is incredible. Yeah. And yeah. still crushing show. for us. Listens to the yeah. show. He does. Way. Hi, Joe. 
Uh, and listen, in addition, if you want to sign up for Real Blend Premium, it's a service that we offer to uh, to our listeners, which gives them an ad free version of the show and a podcast um, and a newsletter uh, that gets written every week. And this week, Gabe has reminded me that it is a newsletter week. So you will be getting something from me uh, on Friday, right as a new episode of the show, actually, as this episode of the show drops. And the reason why. The majority of you folk are here <clears throat> is because in our title, it probably says Christopher Nolan interview. <laughs> now, Nolan has been on the show before, so you would think that we would be, you know, reserved in check. Returning no. guest. <laughs> it's not quite, you know, the first time. But what I will say is that the first time through, while it was outstanding to have Mr. Nolan on the on the show, we were discussing this before we got him. It was a 15 minute segment uh, on behalf of Tenet. He was paired with his leading man, John David Washington. It was set up in a junket scenario, but for um, some reason, uh, with the technical aspects of it, we weren't allowed to use the video aspect. It was only audio. You can go back and find this uh, Christopher Nolan, John David Washington conversation. Terrific conversation. John David was outstanding. Uh, Nolan was terrific as well, too. Uh, please go back and find that. This was 20 minutes in person. With the three of us being able to sit down across from Nolan. 23 minutes. 23 minutes. To sit down across from Nolan and discuss Oppenheimer. Uh, and so to, uh, to me, I'm saying this this is a little bit more special. I think it was Jake who said it finally feels like we got him. Right. Does that yeah. that's fair? Yeah, because I, I remember walking away from that Nolan tenant interview sort of. I don't want to use the word disappointed, but just sort of going. That's not how I wanted uh, Nolan on the show to be. It just, there, there are a lot of it, there. Well, there are a lot of aspects about it that that you know uh, it just it just wasn't the way we wanted. This this feels like the way we wanted Nolan. Like on the last one feels like a trailer. This one feels like we got the feature. All right, we have made you wait long enough. This is uh, the real blend interview with Christopher Nolan on behalf of Oppenheimer. Don't forget, on the other side, we're going to tell the story of how the interview came together, as well as review Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. But Nolan waits for no one, and so therefore. Here he is, back on the Rebel Podcast. So this is your opportunity to go longer than the normal four-minute junket slot and really dig into uh, sure. the beauty of Oppenheimer. And I want to start here. Um, there's a great quote that's going to resonate with me for a really long time, which says, theory will take you only so far. Mm -hmm. um, and we all grew up as film geeks who studied film and, and, and you know watched the filmmakers that we love. I assume you did too, but you eventually got to a point where you went beyond theory mm -hmm. to execution. And I would love to just hear about uh, what made you go from film theory and studying all of it to making it a reality. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about the line as it would apply to filmmaking or yeah, that difference between admiring the work of filmmakers and then sort of moving to try and achieve similar things yourself. Uh, I didn't go to film school. So for me, it was a much more raw process of um, enjoying films and experiencing narratives. But I started making films when I was very young. I, mean, I was seven years old. I think I started borrowing my dad's Super 8 camera and making little, you know, I wouldn't even call them films, really, but just mm. shooting images and, and putting them together and mm. uh, experimenting with what, what that could do. Um, so for me, the things have always, the practice and the theory have always been in parallel. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a good way to approach something like that because it's a complicated, um, infinitely complex uh, craft, really. Sure. Um, so you learn by doing. I mean, I think it was Stanley Kubrick who famously said the, the best way to learn how to make films is to make a film. Mm. Um, Certainly, that was my my path was was doing, and then thinking about it and looking at other people's work, and and that would inform your process. But really, there's no substitute for the real world for actually doing things and uh, seeing how things play out. And you know, that's something it, it can be difficult to explain to the studios sometimes, the people who are paying vast sums of money for for films and taking huge risks. Really, um, it can be difficult to explain why you can't plan everything exactly why you know the real world and and real things change the way you want to do things or they change the way the actors feel about things or how you want to exactly shoot things so with all the preparation in the world it's not an excuse to not be prepared right. but you know you have to be open to reality and what that's going to going to put into the film you're you're trying to make and for me the more areas in which you can embrace reality the more areas in which you can allow the real world to inform your your process, the richer the film becomes. 
told you this a few times before, but cinematic immersion changed for me the day I saw Dark Knight in 70 millimeter IMAX on mm. 143. I had never seen anything like that before. When you when you flip that truck with Jim Wilkie, I, I watched the DVD features and learned so much. And I love the narration you put in those featurettes. But I wanted to talk to you about how IMAX has changed since that film now to Oppenheimer. I know mm. with Tenet and Interstellar and Dunkirk, um, but here you have a brand new format with the 65 millimeter a black and white IMAX mm. footage, which is incredible and it's brilliant to watch. But when you go back to The Dark Knight, which I think turns 15 years this year, uh, I wonder what you know what you look at there in the IMAX that you and Wally were dealing with at that point and now with mm. Hoytema here. I'm just curious kind of what, that, what you see over that time span and how IMAX has expanded. I mean, a lot of changes. When, when we did The Dark Knight, Wally and myself uh, and everybody involved with that, it was the first time a feature film, uh, you know, a, a two hour feature film, Hollywood feature had used the format. It had always been used for 40 minute uh, films that were shown in institutions. Um, but the DMR process that had come along that allowed us to take Batman Begins, for example, and blow it up from 35 mil, but play it in IMAX theaters had led to this proliferation of Hollywood movie playing IMAX theaters um, mm. around around America and, and other places in the world. And so we sort of in tandem with that, that, that showed me an opportunity to say, okay, I first saw that format when I was about 15, 16 years old at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago on an Omnimax screen, you know, one of the dome screens. Mm. And as an aspiring filmmaker, my first thought was, why isn't Hollywood using this format? Why aren't we making films that can be as viscerally impactful, you know, as, as these documentaries are. Mm. With The Dark Knight, we got, we got to do that, but it was, very, it was very experimental, really, and we had, to, we had a lot of planning, we had a lot of uncertainty about how much it was going to cost, how difficult it would be, how we would deal with um, the long reload times on the cameras, the noise of the cameras, all these sorts of things. Um, but it worked very well, and it was, I wouldn't say it was easier than we'd expected. You know, I mean, the first time we mounted an IMAX camera on a Steadicam, it broke, it sheared off, you know, <laughs> broke the arm stuff. So, you know, they're like, okay, we need a stronger Steadicam, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but over the years, we've refined things. And so, you know, we built, Wally and I built a lens for the Dark Knight that at the time was the only IMAX lens that could open up to a T2. So it was very valuable for shooting night. That's why we built it for the, the night work on the dark night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, other filmmakers used to fight over this lens because it was the only one in existence. <laughs> and, you know, I would lend it to J.J. Abrams and he would send it back and it would go to Zack Snyder, you know, whatever. Um, and then over the years, IMAX started making more and more lenses. We got Panavision involved, collaborating with IMAX. Uh, and so Hoyter has been able to uh, make all kinds of interesting demands on what those lenses can do. Um, and what sets of equipment we're able to take uh, onto the floor. Um, certainly with Dunkirk, you know, Hoyter, he very much, he's an engineer. He thinks like an engineer. He can build things with his own two hands. He's really, he's quite remarkable in that degree. And, and he challenged um, IMAX, Panavision, the people in the film with Dunkirk to figure out how to get that IMAX camera into a Spitfire cockpit mm -hmm. and actually fly in the air with it and everything. And that required all kinds of specialist approaches, specialist equipment, you know, snorkel lenses, attachments, <laughs> things like that. Um, and so that that spirit of experimentation and wanting to push the boundaries has continued all the time we've been using the format. And when we were planning Oppenheimer, it was very clear to me that I wanted to mix color and black and white. I wanted to tell the story from Oppenheimer's point of view. I wanted to use IMAX to put you into his mindset. Uh, but I also wanted to contrast that with a more objective view, which is the Robert Downey Jr.'s character, uh, Lewis Strauss, it's more his point of view. Mm -hmm. And that stuff needed to be black and white. But we didn't want to compromise the image quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no such thing as large format uh, black and white movie film. So we had to go to Kodak and Hoyter, he's up for these kind of challenges. You know, we went to Kodak, <laughs> went to Photocam. It's like, okay, they can make the film. They'll give us a test batch if you could figure out how to process it, you know. Um, and in the end, with a lot of complexity and a lot of, a lot of R&D, uh, we were able to then shoot our hair and makeup tests using large format black and white. Oh, and wow. Go to City Walk, you know, in Los Angeles and see it on this, you know, 80 foot screen. And it was just a magical thing to see. It was really, really wonderful to see a new innovation in in you know 
celluloid you know film technology it was really wow. really fun thing to be a part of that's amazing yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of a magical thing to see we saw the film last night in the way that you intended 70 millimeter IMAX great uh, and we have a joke on our show anytime any of us are on a plane and see someone watching Dunkirk on the back of a seat <laughs> or the Dark Knight on an iPad we always go ah the way Nolan intended. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm sort of curious about, I guess, just the worst way you've ever seen anyone watching one of your films. And if you see someone on a plane watching it on an Apple Watch, he turns it how off. you don't go over there and just slap their hand. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean to disappoint. But the, the truth is, I'm, I'm a child of the home video age. You know, I grew up with VHS mm -hmm. um, and the birth of VHS and watching films at the home. And I discovered some of my favorite films, like Blade Runner. You know, I first watched a grainy pirate VHS tape. Um, <laughs> but there was, there was a terrific article that M. Night Shyamalan wrote some years ago in one of the trades where he was talking about the theatrical experience and how it filters down to every version of the film that people see. <laughs> so yes, the economics of the movie business my entire life and before I was born have been that more people numerically may wind up seeing your film on television, mm -hmm. and these days, you know, right down to phones, things like that. But the, the equation doesn't change, which is you shoot the film in the best way possible, you present it in the absolute best way possible, and that experience trickles down to these other formats. Mm -hmm. For audiences who didn't get to experience it in the theater, they're still aware when they watch that film on whatever format, they have a different expectation of that than they would of a TV commercial mm -hmm. or a television program. You know, the audience is very sophisticated in that regard, and the weight of the initial presentation carries with the film through its entire life, whatever formats, now and as the contracts say, now and ever to be devised, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And the thing with IMAX film in particular is, because it is the, the highest resolution, um, highest quality imaging format ever devised, when you take a shot on IMAX film, you've captured information that can then translate into every possible format right down to somebody watching on their watch yeah. um <laughs> and i think that that you know the, the flip side of of the potential diminishment of films when people only get to experience them in smaller ways um you have to account for the access that that gives people mm. to film history particularly yeah. i mean we've grown up in times where we can watch any almost any film of any era that, that we've heard of or that we're sort of interested to experience and so yes it might not be ideal circumstances but you're also getting a real breadth of experience of, of film watching and so it cuts both ways but the thing that's really important is that your initial release of a film you have to give it the best possible chance you have to give as many people possible the chance to see it in the grandest most concentrated way and then you trust that as it goes out to the world in different ways, that, that whatever authority that gives the imagery and the, the picture that, that carries with it. I do want to mention, um, I was watching Dark Knight on uh, HBO Max the other night, and Kevin got so mad at me that he legitimately ordered the 4K on yeah. Amazon. It has arrived at my house while I'm here. Because <laughs> you, you get the 178 at home, yeah. and you get, the, you get the transitions between the wide and the IMAX. Yeah. Sometimes I pad my collection by just telling Kevin I'm watching things <laughs> 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 on TNT. Hey, I'm watching this on TNT. And then he's like, no, no, immediately. So, so. Um, the relationship in this film that I was really fascinated by was Oppenheimer and Einstein and how that they were um, experts in their field and, and had this deep admiration for each other but were separated by generations. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make the uh, the apply it to filmmakers. I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have an Einstein, if you had an Einstein who was separated by you uh, by a generation – who you wish you could have just gone to with a problem and said, like, <laughs> hey, how would you do this? I, you know, that's that's a tricky question to answer. I have so many idols of, of cinema past. Uh, I grew up loving the, the films of Ridley Scott. Mm. Um, and I did actually have the pleasure, have had the pleasure of meeting him several times over the years. Mm. Um, but I've never dared inquire too deeply as to how he would solve a particular problem. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, they say you should be careful not to meet your idols, but but in the case of really, it was wonderful to meet him. And, and 
Uh, I've had really positive interactions with him, and you know, I have so much respect for him. He holds so. the record for the most cursing on our show. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Unless you want to break it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. feel free. I don't want to compete with Sir Ridley. <laughs> any, you would have to work pretty hard. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> that was an R-rated podcast yes, for us, was. for sure. <laughs> you know, speaking of the R rating, this I believe this is the first R-rated film you've released in over 20 years, I think, since It makes me feel very old. <laughs> but I feel very I, old. But yes, that's but true. I, I do find that interesting because yeah. I, I had to sneak into Memento because I, I, I think I was 16 when that came out. So right. what's interesting to me, that, like all these years later, and I want to bring up Emma Thomas as well, who's one of the greatest producers in the world in this yeah. business. And I'm wondering what conversations you both have about making this R-rated because yeah. I do find it interesting. And, I th you know, th to me, the R-rating definitely needed to be there because of the language. And obviously you have other things in the film as well, which I won't go into. But yeah. how did you decide, OK, we're going to go R on this one? What, 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 what the decision? came to that i mean the decision i suppose the key thing to answer in that question is that the decision was made at script stage interesting and when we approached universal about making the film it was very clear we said okay it's going to be an r-rated film um very often with different genres um you know when we were making the dark knight for example which feels like an r-rated um, movie it I does mean, yeah. and you know, there was a certain amount of negotiation and editing that had to happen to secure the PG-13 rating, as is often the case with, with films that are edgy PG-13 films. And, mm -hmm. and that's an area that I've been working in for years. Yeah. Um, but those are films that you go into with the studio knowing full well that that's the rating you're aiming for. You're aiming for that, that audience, that breadth of audience. And so you have to, you have to change things to make it work. And you have to get clever about how you do things and, and you know, how you present violence in, in the action scenes. And things like the like pencil, that. like you don't, you just like, you just like see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah. Things by implication, not red blood squibs, just yeah. gray dust squibs, things like that. You, there are all kinds of things that you're doing all along. With this, um, and the running time is a similar thing. It's a three hour film, and mm -hmm. I've never made a three hour film before. I've made long films, you know, Interstellar is almost yeah. three hours, but, yeah. but not. Um, once again, it's script stage. You know, I said to Emma, we talked about it a lot, and I said, for this film to play well for an audience, for it to be exciting for an audience, I have to write it as a long film. I can't write it as an overstuffed, out of control, shorter film mm -hmm. that we try and squeeze down. I have to actually embrace that three hours. It was a 180 page script, and we told the studio it was gonna be R rated in a page a minute. You know, it's sort of exactly what, what we did. Um, and that's the important way in which I would answer the question. The decision was made very early on that, that you know, this is a subject matter we didn't want to compromise on. We weren't fitting into a particular genre. Uh, and so we're really just telling the story the strongest way that we know how. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of upfront with everybody about what that was going to be. Wow, that's great. Uh, some of the greatest actors of all time are frequent collaborators of mm. yours, and many of them are in this film. One of our favorites is, of course, the great Sir Michael Caine. Uh, mm. And, you know, it's obviously there are films where he's very much apparent. He's right there, main character. Mm. Uh, other films, maybe like Dunkirk, where he's a little <laughs> bit more hidden in mm. that. Uh, is the great Sir Michael Caine hidden anywhere in Oppenheimer? <laughs> <laughs> he's a countdown. <laughs> he's, he's with us in spirit, but not in, not in actuality. Oh, okay. No, no, he's... He's, he wasn't able to uh, to join us for this one, uh, but he's always with us in spirit. And, did, uh, I've had the most wonderful collaboration with him over the years. Did but you know, a lot of people know that he's in Dunk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's on the radio with Tom uh, Hardy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're that's, on the right podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. All right, so we um, have had this discussion a number of times because Mr. Tarantino has come on the show a bunch of times, and we all know he's notoriously going to make one more film, and then he says he's going to be finished. Yeah. And do Where you believe is, him? I don't. I do. I believe him. I don't. He seems, I think he's, he's done very serious yeah. about it. He does. He's, he's gonna, done with film, but that doesn't mean he won't television. do TV or write books. His or books are good. Yeah. At the same time, yeah. Mr. Scorsese just came out recently and talked about the weight of time and how he feels like he's racing time to tell as many stories as possible. <laughs> with both of those opinions out there, I'm curious which one you gravitate towards. Do you want to have a, a body of work that you stop or are you going to race time? I mean, I, I think I'm both. You know, the truth is... I understand both points of view. Um, it's very, it's addictive to tell stories in cinema. It's really, it's a lot of hard work, but it's very fun. Um, it's something you feel driven to do. And so it's a little hard to imagine 
voluntarily stopping the and by no means do we about. want you to yeah. <laughs> don't, please, this please is not, do not we're trying to encourage you, right? no, no, no. do not <laughs> no but I, but I but I also see you know Quentin's point has always been that and he never very graciously he's never specific about the films he's talking about or whatever but he's looking at some of the work done by filmmakers in later years and feeling that if it can't live up to the, the heyday mm. um, it would be better if it didn't didn't exist, and and I think that's a very purest point of view. Mm -hmm. It's the point of view of a cinephile who you know prizes film history. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm not sure that I would trust my own sense of the absolute value of a piece of work mm -hmm. to know whether or not it it should have been brought into existence. I'm a big fan. I mean, as is Quentin of of films that maybe don't fully achieve what they tried to, but there's something in there that's a performance or a little structural thing or a scene, you mm. know, that's that's wonderful. And and so, you know, I yes, I understand the thing wanting to keep a sort of perfect reputation or something, but also kind of don't want to take anything off the table. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. We talk, he's yeah. with Ridley. He, if Ridley had stopped at 10, yeah. he wouldn't made he wouldn't make Gladiator. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. is where we did the math. I'm sorry. Kevin. We can't yeah. we can't leave here without bringing up Ludwig, um, who's yeah. one of the greatest composers of all time. And I know you've worked with multiple composers over your David obviously at yeah. Hands and and now Ludwig. And I I love it, seeing the different like Wally and Hands and then you had like kind of like, you know, it's different people brought on each time and then you stay with them for a bit, which I love. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you you have been the filmmaker to me that has really made Made me aware that that the score can be a leading character mm -hmm. that it really you know the dark knight really kind of brought that to my attention and obviously through tenant and everything that you've done and here it's a beautiful score violin based it sounds like and it's very like it, it, it's but it's also haunting and you use score as you would a leading character i feel in your films yeah are your conversations with him like an actor in terms of finding an arc because his main theme, Oppenheimer's main theme, you hint at beautifully throughout the film, mm. and we get it when he, you know, with the hat. It, it's such a great moment. So I'm wondering for you, you know, that relationship with him, and I know you don't use temp score, so I really yeah. find that interesting. Yeah, don't use temp score, so you're never falling in love with something you can't have, or yeah. you're insisting on a, a copy of or something. So I've never really done that with all the composers I've worked with, have worked from their, their demos. But to bring it back to Sir Ridley, I don't know if you've ever listened to the commentary on Thelma and Louise, but there's yeah. a moment where he talks about the music in the film, and he says, you know, people will say that if the music's working well in a film, you don't notice it. And he's like, that's complete bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> we have a swear word. We got one. We got one. You I'm can say quoting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> but he, you know, he's just like, it's nonsense. It's like yeah. the music you should lift and, and elevate. Yes. And, and I remember listening to that many years ago and thinking, no, he's absolutely right. Like the, the sophistry, the sort of like artificial restraint of like, oh no, we're going to, you know, everything should be polite and, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I've never really uh, agreed with that film music either. I think that when, when it's working, when it's something that you feel as a filmmaker, you, you want to put in there in, in a passionate and, and obvious way, it becomes very much character in the film. And I love movies that do that, you know. I, I mean, I love Ridley Scott's work with various composers, including Hans, mm. uh, you know, or Vangelis, um, or Hugh Hudson's Chair of Fire, you know, it's unthinkable without the music. Um, with Ludwig in this, the only thing I really had to give him was to say, okay, I think the violin is the right mm. starting point for this character because he's so literally highly strung. And you know, <laughs> violin is fretless, so it's being tuned by the player just with the most minute, and you're always feeling like it can go from intense sort of romanticism and beauty into something just unlistable and awful. Mm. with just the slightest of twitch of the fingers. Mm. And so it felt like the knife edge we kind of needed. Wow. And he sort of grew out from there this, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's an extraordinary score. Yeah. I think his work is remarkable. And the, the soundtrack album that's coming out, I mean, it's, it's an hour and a half long. It's huge. Wow. Because the truth is with most film music, it tends to be based on several demos that work and get, they get repurposed by the movie. Mm -hmm. So you're repeating motifs, so you're re-editing them, and they're, and they're changing. Mm -hmm. But it, it tends to grow in that way. And with this film, as we came to try and compile, okay, what's, once we finished, it's like, okay, what's the essence? We realized there's so much original and unique thought 
in, in everything he's done throughout the film, mm. that it wasn't really possible to just consolidate things. You had to, um, you know, you had to, to let it breathe. And, and there's an enormous amount of, you know, music in, in the film, but I think it's, it's really, uh, it's beautifully written, it's beautifully recorded, and uh, we really, really tried to maximize its impact in the film. Brought me back to that little D note That's that awesome. Zimmer had with him, that it goes dissident in uh, <laughs> Dark Knight. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. We just wanted by saying, sir, thank you for, yeah, like, your, your awesome. films are the reason we have this podcast. So yes. yeah. thank you for Well, thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate, appreciate, appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We need to thank our good friends at Universal Studios for getting us time with Christopher Nolan. This was a... Uh, d- you know, I say once in a lifetime, I know we've gotten him before. It does feel very rare to be able to get this time to sit down with Nolan, uh, especially in person. Uh, we are going to review uh, both Oppenheimer and Barbie in full uh, on next week's program, which is when they're both reaching theaters. And I want to also tease the fact that on next week's um, interview, it's going to be Greta Gerwig, who is joining the show to talk about Barbie. Um, but we wanted to... Get to Christopher Nolan to tell the story about what happened uh, on that junket day, because it is truly it's going to give me hives uh, just thinking about it. So I want to set the stage a little bit. Um, and, you know, that if you're new, if you're new to the show, you might hear a phrase that we use every once in a while. It's called if it happens. Uh, hashtag if it happens, which is a running joke for us that until the interview is done, legitimately locked in. um there are ways that it could potentially go wrong, especially due to the fact that we deal with a lot of travel to get to these interviews. But then we've shown up at at different junkets over the years where talent backs out um, or something will happen with a film. Jake has a story about The Dark Knight Rises where the audio and the the video aspect of the film didn't sync up and he watched it the next morning, but there was a possibility that that could have gone wrong. So we've adapted if it happens and it's always just like it's a kind of a joke. But this one almost didn't happen for a very special member. For Kevin McCarthy, <laughs> for for Kevin McCarthy it's a way of life. Of and I'm the one who's always like, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's always like saying if it happens and the guys are like, Kevin, come on, it's it's happening. We're, we're yeah. good. And I'm like, guys, it's if it happens and 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 they all and both Jake and Sean and Gabriel was like, but it's but it's booked and we're already here. And I'm like, yeah, but it could still not happen. You never so know. The day that we we're flying up, we we're flying to New York City. And uh, Jake and I were arriving at the exact same time in different airports. And and when we are heading to the airport and when we're on our planes and when we're and we're in the text thread communicating, we're always letting each other know where we're at, what stage, who's landing, where, what should we do beforehand? When are we going to meet? And then we get a message from Kevin and then uh, Kevin, I'll pass it over to you. (laughs) And the message from Kevin comes across and he says, my flight's delayed. There's um, lightning and thunder in the area. Mm. Right now, I have no update is what he said. And I'm going to put the time frame at about 1230 and to let everybody know that we are due to see Oppenheimer at seven o'clock at night in New York City. This is now 1230. Kev, tell us how you're feeling at that point. <laughs> OK, well, to, to give some backstory, this is my most anticipated movie of the year. Yes. So uh, probably I would argue of all time, I, I can't think of a film that I was more excited about in my lifetime because of the connection I have with my grandmother and, the, and reading the book together and just seeing this movie was 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 a huge deal to me, especially the way we were seeing it. As I, as I said at the top of the show, there are multiple ways you can watch this film, but the rare the most rare format is 70 millimeter IMAX. That's when you get the full one, four, three and you're watching it on film. And David Keeley who's one of the incredible people behind uh, at IMAX uh, was there at the screening, making sure the print was perfect. Wait, this is, is very the- funny. Kevin says to me, he's like, we better get, we should get David Keeley on the episode uh, to talk about IMAX. And I literally start making fun of him. I'm like, who dude, no one knows who that is. No, David Keeley. No, like it's, this is clearly a very technical person. It's just at yeah. IMAX. We walk into the screening of Oppenheimer and David Keeley is there. <laughs> Kevin yeah. goes, Oh my God, David Keeley. You're actually, yeah. yeah. I couldn't believe it. Kevin treated yeah. him like he was Robert Downey Jr. He was a celebrity to him. Can I add a funny, cause you bring that up. Um, and I won't say more than this because this is like a who knows if this is going to happen. But some behind the scenes things that I've even told the guys about. 
that's there's a non zero chance that we might actually get him for a partnership thing later this year. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. really? Dude. I, don't, I so, don't know that it's going to happen. That's all I'll say on the Sean, show. Sean, you and I need to do our homework. On I guess we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I met the man now. I've talked with him, yeah. so I'm up to speed. Back to your plane. You're on right. the plane. And I mentioned that. I mentioned that name because it's a big deal. So, OK, so I'm I get to the airport now. I haven't told you guys this yet. The night before my flight, so I had a 1230 flight. We were supposed to all be in New York by 3 p.m. That was what the, the 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 email said, just so you can get you can get land, you can get to your hotel. Then you go to the movie. I had a gut feeling the night before that told me to take the 8 a.m. flight. OK. And I didn't listen to it. <laughs> and I remember to be, getting to up be at, fair, though, Kev, if you had a private jet with the the pilot sleeping in your house and you were both going to the jet together the next day, yeah. you would still be like, hey, man, sorry, I know you're asleep. Should we leave now? <laughs> you have the keys. Should we leave now? No, a part, I almost left the day before. So I, I get up. I'm like, all right, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm going to I'm going to chill, have my coffee. I'm going to go to the airport. Plenty of time. Twelve thirty flight. This is a you know, uh, this is a quick flight to LaGuardia from Dulles. I'll be I'll be good. Of course, I get there. Lightning, thundering, they shut down the runway. Like nobody's taking off. It's 1230. I text you guys and I'm like, all right, guys, they just delayed my flight. Now, a delay at that point shouldn't be a problem. You know, no, you know, like that hour flight, delay. like you said, is short. You, you could do that flight in, in, in an hour at, at most. Right. So I should have been in New York by two o'clock. So time goes by, keeps going by, keeps going by, keeps going by. Around 2.30, they finally let us on the plane. And I'm like, oh, gosh, thank you so much. I'll still be able to land at 3.45. I'll just jet to the screening or whatever. Because I had already texted the guys like an hour or two prior to me getting to the airport saying, hey, let's all leave for the, air, for the theater before anybody else does so we can get the best seats possible. So we had a plan to leave the hotel at 5. We were going to get there at 6 and hang out and talk about movies, whatever. I get on the plane. 2.30, we start backing away from the gate and we're sitting in a line about to take off. And I, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm like, oh, thank gosh. OK, I'll, I'll get there. Everything will be fine. Air, the pilot comes over the over the intercom. His first words were, unfortunately, which <laughs> immediately like there was a, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I and he goes, unfortunately, LaGuardia apparently has shut down their ground control. There's too many planes coming in. They don't have room for us to land. I do not have an update and I will not have an update until 345. And that's that's so crazy, because whenever you said that, that LaGuardia had a shutdown, like this would be the moment in the movie where they cut to Sean and I driving down the road to like Holiday <laughs> Road and like the sun is right. shining and the sky is yeah. blue. And OK, so, so Kevin, I want to I want to jump in really quick. And I and, and I have to confess something to you. And it's only funny now that it's worked out. Yeah. Um, you, you while we with all this was going on and we knew that we know you well enough as a friend and as a person to know that internally you were probably panicking and, and having a tough Ooh. time at that moment. And Sean and I were trying to be very positive and continue to give you options of like, well, it could happen because X, Y and Z and the time right. could happen. You can still the make the could theater. Work out. You can still yeah. do this. We we're trying yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. Sean and I were also talking separately going, this motherfucker ain't going to make it. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I so Sean and I were also being realistic about what we're like, like we weren't stupid about the, uh, the, the seriousness of the situation. We were just trying to <laughs> like alleviate what we knew was probably a very difficult moment, but we and, also yeah. like, we're also very pessimistic in a very separate toned like chat. If it I makes also you feel want to say in that side chat, it started very funny yeah. <laughs> where we were like, but then, admit, people, yeah, but then we admitted like, okay, this isn't funny anymore. Then it hit a point where we were like, oh, this isn't funny anymore. What if he really doesn't? Yeah. Make it? yeah. And so, and uh, there's, there's a couple things that happen that are happening here that are important to know. Cause I know, I know we gotta, we gotta move on here, but one of the things that's important to note is that when you don't, and there's a fear of if you miss the movie, will you be able to do the interviews? And I don't yeah. know for a fact how Universal and Christopher Nolan runs their their idea of screenings and whether or not you could still talk to the cast and the filmmakers if you don't see it. But, but also Universal and the junket aside, 
imagine you make it for the interview and you can do the interview, but we're prepping yeah. questions and Kevin and Sean have to, and you, like all of you have to combat the idea of they're trying to write questions to the movie because that's what we're there for. But also it's your most anticipated movie of all time. And they don't want to spoil or like, right. you know, they want to keep that your first viewing precious. Sure. Yeah. What a just an impossible. I was actually saying I said like ethically, I didn't think Kevin would allow himself to do the job. Yeah, he probably he might not have. Yeah, I just wouldn't have been able to face Christopher Nolan because yeah. I mean, I've been waiting years for this movie. And so so all of a sudden, like three forty three thirty eight hits and Jake's Kevin's first question just would have been. So what happens? Please yeah. remember. OK, you're saying three thirty eight. You're in D.C. The screening is at seven o'clock in New York City. Correct. It's and I'm landing in. I'm landing in rush hour. <laughs> okay. So, and I have all my bags. Yeah. So the three thirty eight hits and the pilot comes over and goes, we're taking off in nine minutes. And I'm oh. like, Oh my gosh, this is, this might happen. Oh wait. To, and to, one lady to, had said next to Kevin, one lady oh, had said, Oh God, which is the meanest thing in the world to say to Kevin. She goes, the longer we well, stay out here, we're going to have to go back and refuel. <laughs> we have to go back to the gate and refuel. <laughs> so long story short, pilot gets the window. We take off. I think he literally got there in 40 minutes, 40 minutes. Yep. I had enough time to land and I spent one hundred and thirty dollars of my own money for this driver to drive me to the hotel. I threw my bags in the, the room, had the guy circle around the city, come back to get Sean, Jake and myself. We get there at six oh nine. I'll never forget it. And just walking up to the AMC Lincoln Square with my buddies. And then J Sean and I are joking about, hey, we should get David Keeley on the show. And then literally, as he's we walk in the, in the front door, yeah, the the David lobby. Keeley is standing in the lobby. So it, not only did I almost miss it, it ended up being the best possible experience I could have ever had. I sat with my two of my best friends. We sat in that theater. And then the next day, the interview you just heard happened. All right. So and let's, it was uh, very, very stressful, but it was all worth it. We're going to review the movie in full next week. As we mentioned, um, let's talk about the interview itself. Um, let's talk about getting to sit across from Nolan and 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 go in through now. So we've we've done the prep, as you guys understand. Um, you know how we do this. We break down all of our questions. We come at it from different perspectives. These guys got Nolan for television. I didn't. I was only getting him for the podcast on behalf of Real Blend. So they had certain questions they wanted to ask for TV. We had other questions that we were going to ask in terms of the podcast. We had a pretty good flow of how it was going to go. We went into the room beforehand. We talked to the guys who were running the cameras before because uh, Nolan was doing some TV throughout the course of the day. He took a break for lunch and we were his first thing after lunch. Um, we were a little bit, you know, kind of hovering. Can we sit here? Can we do this? Can we do that? And then they finally told us to sit down. Nolan comes in and the interview begins. Um, you guys have heard it. Uh, you guys can tell us in the comments below uh, how you thought that it went. Um, Jake, what was your impression? What was the thing that surprised you the most uh, about how it went and, and maybe how you felt before it versus how you felt after it? Well, you know, we we like you said, we got him for TV before and and we've all sort of talked to to Christopher Nolan in the past enough times where like it, it's one of those things that you always say like, oh, he's good in the context of Christopher Nolan. Like Christopher Nolan is a fairly low key, subdued interview. And so it's more about what he's telling you than how he's telling. like, you're, you know, we very rarely are you going to get a, da, 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 out of Christopher Nolan. But what yeah. you want is good content. You want to talk about his filmography. And, and he's always good in that regard. That being said, um, you know, there were a lot of adjectives I was expecting walking into that room and funny, hilarious <laughs> are, are not among the two adjectives that I expected to to use to describe the interview. There was a moment. I don't know. I, I really I really do hope that those of you at home get the chance to to watch the actual video itself on YouTube, because there was a moment in the interview where I was looking at Nolan and wondering, what's he doing with his face? What's that <laughs> thing he's doing? But what he was doing was laughing yeah. and smiling yes. and having a good time, which with all due respect to Christopher Nolan is not aspects. Those are not aspects that, that are often attributed to Christopher Nolan conversations. Right. Uh, but the fact that, you know, we and we often talk about, you know, needing that extra time and sort of needing that those extra couple of minutes to sort of break into someone, something that's a little bit harder to do in a, in a five minute uh, junk of TV slot. And there was a moment 
it, it happens and it's on video where Christopher Nolan in the middle of an answer leans back in his chair hmm. and, and his uh, posture is that of someone who is just much more relaxed and is just hanging out talking. And yeah. I, I want to say maybe it was whenever he was answering one of you guys or, or maybe one of you I guys remember. were asking a question because whenever other you guys were talking, I allowed myself to really kind of focus on, on, on who he was and what he was doing. And in that moment, I thought to myself, oh, we got him. Yeah, like this is this, this is it. This is yeah. it. Um, and once we started cracking jokes, that's when I thought like, oh, this is done. Like so this is this is game. There was there were two moments that that I realized that the the veneer was down. And we talk about we talk about this a lot whenever we get to do a group interview and we're we're sort of in a flow and we're finding our rhythm. And when the person who we're speaking to realizes what kind of show we are. Um, and the one time was when you brought up. Jake brought up the question of like, what's the worst format you've seen somebody watch your movies in? And when he admitted to us that he was a, a child of the VHS era and how he watched, you know, the first time he experienced Blade Runner was on a scratchy VHS. And mm. and I was like, this is Nolan, the film geek. You know, this is Nolan, the nerd who loves movies the way that we love him, telling us about his childhood stories. And then the other one was when he mentioned how uh, much he reveres uh, Sir Ridley Scott. And how he was like, I would never dream of asking Ridley, you know, Sir Ridley, a question about uh, about cinema. And I was like, Nolan, that's how everyone feels about you, dude. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> everyone's afraid to approach you. And the fact that he's afraid to approach Ridley is hilarious to me. And so those moments when when he kind of broke through and, and, and connected. And as you said last, like I shared those photos on social media of us all laughing um, because I think that that's not what people w- would have expected from a Nolan interview is him to actually be like cracking jokes and, and, he, and laughing along and having a good time. the idea of you just naming movies you were watching in a bad format to get Kevin to buy them for you. Like, <laughs> like that, that yielded a real, genuine, true laughter. And it's just, you it know, and, and I, you know, Gabe and I were talking about this before the show. Something that he said that I really like the more I think about it is, you know, in his acceptance that not everyone is going to be able to see his films in 70 millimeter IMAX. For him, it's all about accessibility. And, and we've talked about that, uh, you know, I think whenever we talked about Roma back in the day, um, you know, movies, you know, the, the, the availability of something being on Netflix, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, you know, I think hearing him say, look, yeah, like, do I want you to see my film in the best way possible? Sure. Great. But like, it really does sound like he, him just saying, I just want you to see my movie. Like, yeah. I really like, I just, I just want you to be able to see it. And that's, and I think it kind of, I think there is this mentality amongst movie fans that there is this elitist attitude about uh, Christopher Nolan. And I felt like uh, you'd have a really hard time making that argument after listening to the interview that we did with him. When I walked into my television slot with him, which was, you know, four to five minutes long, I, I was a ball of stress. I was outside with Jake. We were out in the hallway. I was I was like, dude, do you think this question will be OK? Do you think it'll find it too personal, et cetera? Um, even sitting in that room by myself with Christopher Nolan, with the camera and and, and the producers and publicists around, I still feel on edge. I can't. Mm. It's hard to pay attention. It's hard to listen because I'm so nervous. There's a timer in the corner counting me down. I've you know, this movie means everything to me. I read this book. I, I have so much I want to ask him. So it's it's nerve wracking. And I, I love it. I love what I do because the rush of it is fun. But there's something about walking into that room with you guys that day. Um, and we sat down together. They adjusted our boom mics. I didn't feel nervous in that moment. I felt completely That's safe. Awesome. That's awesome. I knew that the two guys left and right of me had me. I knew that we had each other. I knew that we were going to hold each other up. I knew that we were going to I knew our questions are great. And people talk about prep. We were downstairs in this lobby area in a corner on a couch working on our questions as Christopher Nolan walked by us yeah. a couple times to go to a press conference. And that's, that's the reality of how crazy the situation was. Um, so <laughs> that we to had be, to shush. So Christopher yeah. Nolan wouldn't hear our question. Shh, here he comes. <laughs> but, but to be in an, a Christopher Nolan interview and actually <clears throat> be relaxed in a way um, and listening and mm. actually there and not thinking about a four minute window I have where I have to get questions in was mind-blowing to me it happened with tarantino happened with tom hanks it happened here um there's just it allows me to fully be in the moment and and i understand that 
after I ask my question, Jake's going to come in with his question. Then Sean goes. So I have a moment to sit there and look at Christopher Nolan and think to myself, I'm sitting here with Christopher Nolan. Yeah. I used to spend hours, hours watching the Dark Knight Blu-ray features. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. It I was. I haven't guys- felt that way since we left our, ter- our first Tarantino interview. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. We definitely want to hear feedback from you guys in the comments down below. Let's take a really quick break. And on let the us other know side, if we should invite Nolan back. On the other side, we will review Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. All right. So I know we're talking a lot about Christopher Nolan and Oppenheimer. You have to wait until the 21st in order to see that film, because currently in theaters is Christopher McQuarrie's next Mission Impossible film. And this one is called Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One. The first time so far that McQuarrie has done a two parter. Uh, So we went into this one. I went into this one, at least uh, personally, very curious about how it was going to end, where it was going to break, would it be type of a cliffhanger? Uh, We've had a conversation uh, already this year with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse about how when you can get to the end of a movie where you know that there's going to be a second part, uh, how do you feel about how you treat this entire film? Um, Are you do you have to wait for the second part to continue? The movie brings back most of the familiar faces that you know from the franchise, whether it be Simon Pegg and Ving Rhames. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson is back, of course, obviously Tom Cruise. Um, but a lot of new faces, Haley Atwell, Palm Clementiff. Um, oh, I mean, v- Vanessa Kirby is a returning character. A lot of characters coming back from the first movie as well, too. Um, and it's a bit long. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. Is that right? Um, making it, I think, one of the longer mission movies. I think it is the longest mission movie. And is it really? Is it actually ranking so. as the longest mission uh, movie? Um, we're going to get into spoilers um, in, in a minute because it's it's hard to, I think, discuss how we feel about this movie without being able to talk specifics. And so um, if you really want to, you know, not necessarily know the different reasons why we feel the way that we feel, uh, stick around here for our star ratings right now, and then I'll set it up in a in a chance to allow us to speak freely. Um, and I'm going to start and go first because I think I've hinted at this on social media enough that people are starting to if not call me out on it, at least recognize that it didn't. <clears throat> this one doesn't work as well for me as the previous ones have. My star rating for Dead Reckoning Part One is two and a half out of five. Um, I'm I'm kind of stuck there. Uh, mm. I, I, I wanted to go a little bit higher. I can't, um, and I'll explain my my issues with it when we get into the spoiler. Uh, section of the review um, and I'm puzzled by my reaction to it because largely the main creative ingredients are there you know it's it's still McHugh it's still Tom Cruise you know and and his commitment to stunts it's still a lot of the cast members who I really really like and so I guess I'll go into deeper detail about the things that that really didn't work for me um, in the spoiler reaction but uh, I believe you guys liked it more so Kev what would be your star rating out of five for Dead Reckoning? It's funny, I, I've actually gotten away from star ratings recently just because I find that they don't completely uh, show what yeah. I fully feel about something. And I, and, I, and I feel like, and I'll give one here because that's what we're doing, but I've just always found it more interesting to be able to talk about a film freely and then, you know, you get the vibe of what I think about it from You should that. do a podcast, Kev. Yeah, I should do a podcast. It's a good idea. You got you got any producers that I could hook up with? Um, uh, um, let me no think good here. ones uh, at least. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's funny. I'm in between a three and a half and a four. Okay. Um, probably leaning more towards three and a half, three point seven five. Um, I'll dive into why there's a gray area there a little bit. I did like the film. I enjoyed a I enjoyed a good chunk of it. Um, but there are things that I have a big problem with. It's it's my least favorite of the Macquarie mission films. OK, um, but it's still a lot of fun. I still enjoyed it. I still enjoyed a lot of the action, the characters, the performances. Um, there's enough in there that I would recommend you see it. OK, it's just not on the level of to me. Uh, listen, I know Brad Bird did Ghost Protocol. That's my favorite. Um, but Rogue Nation and fallout are outstanding um i don't love the ending of fallout but i do think that this is lesser than 
Rogue Nation and would Fallout. you would you say you sort of fell out with the movie by the end of it? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's funny. I, we're done. The ending you're, is you're, actually <laughs> really good of this movie, but we will get it. We'll dive into that. But um, uh, yeah. all right, we have a two and a half from me, a three point seven five from Kevin. Around. Jake, where'd you land? Uh, three point five for me. I, I, I really liked yeah. it. I think, um, you know, I, I think when we all collectively sort of put all of our cards on the table, I think it's going to be a matter of and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean. I think we all admit that the movie's flawed. You know, I, I mm. you know, by no means are any of us saying yeah. that it is, you know, I, I wouldn't even go as far as saying it's the best action film of the year. I think, I think John no. Wick still takes that title. Yeah, um, 100%. you know, I, you know, so, but I think the, the big, uh, sort of deciding factor for you is just going to be how much you can live with the flaws that you accept are there. Mm. You know, it's one of those things, you know, you, you, Sean, you brought up a good point. Um, about how like all the elements are there. And, and the only thing I can equate it to is like the difference between going to a really nice high class restaurant and getting like a really great burger that's just unbelievable versus going and getting a fast food burger, which like might still be really good, but it's still a fast food burger. Both of those same burger, ingredients. I, I was mean, waiting on someone to make a dumbass <laughs> statement. I, I, <laughs> I did not start that. <laughs> you but basically, you know what I'm talking about? Like it's it's like the, it's the same ingredients and it's the same thing, but like one's just a little bit better than the other. And Jake, I, you know, Jake, the thing look, is, Jake, look, I'm drinking a water burger right now. Gabe, do, do something, man. Dude, like, is, isn't this, like, aren't are we supposed to be in a different version of the show? I'll do this for you, Jake. I, I still feel like I owe you, um, I need to go to a water burger with you and, and have it the way that you suggested. Because no, I, why? Well, Gabe, you and I went together for our first time. I know, but I told him, he gave me like a specific, <laughs> he was like, do all these things. And I was like, nah, that's not a way to judge anything. Like, just give me what you have, which I still yeah. agree with. But I hope all your flights I'll, get canceled on the way to our next I'll, Tarantino I'll interview. I'll hold my judgment completely <laughs> until I get Jake's order, which he loves, and see so, if that fixes that bland burger. You, you know, the thing with, with, and I think this is more of a compliment than anything to, to the mission films, is that for me, it's, I still, I really enjoyed this movie. I had a really good time with it um, and would very much like to see it again it's still in the bottom half of my mission rankings. You mm -hmm. know, if there's, you know, there's right now there's seven films, which means there's top three, the middle one and the bottom three. And I would yeah. put this in the bottom three. And some people have said, are you going to do a mission tier list? We may somewhere down the line do a mission tier list. We just want to talk it about seems like that might be something to. to do. I mean, if if which now he's saying he's going to play this role into his 80s. But like the next Astro. one feels like it has. I know Daenerys is going nuts. She's very excited. If the next one is, in fact, going to have a sense of finality to it, maybe maybe next summer would be a better place to to do the yeah. mission tier list. That's right, the right, so let's use this moment then to transition into spoiler talk. If you haven't seen Dead Reckoning Part One yet, uh, skip ahead. But for the rest of you who did go out and see it early um, and overseas, it started playing in a few in uh, theaters already. It's been playing in some territories. Um, but part of the one of the biggest reasons that I think that this movie has a difficult uh, task ahead of it is that for me, from three to six, this franchise has been just superior to and three is underrated. Everything. Three is really oh, I, I think three is great. J.J. Abrams did a hell you, of I mean, a job with that. You would argue that three is what brought it into what we know Mission Possible is now. I think now. so. Like, like yeah. each director after J.J., I think, took it and ran with it even further. Sure. But three gives you Hoffman as a villain. Has there been a, a better villain than Hoffman? No, I don't think so. No. No. Because I think the incredible. syndicate's kind of a confusing, um, you know, adversary or and then you brought in the 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 apostles and john locke it's start, it's it's starting to get a little bit john confusing. locke was fantastic yeah no i and i loved i loved cavill in it um yeah. i just felt watching this movie that the main beats of it were all done in previous mission movies and done better there's a big sandstorm, you know, shootout with Rebecca Ferguson. And I was like, mm, this is this was a better sandstorm thing in Ghost Protocol when he had to come down from the Burj Khalifa and go chasing after that guy. That the, scene. Oh, 
That scene's incredible. Amazing. The chase scene through Rome is really good, but it reminded me of Rogue Nation and it reminded me of like, and I get like, there's only so many times that you can do something with like the fight on top of the train reminded me extremely of the first mission movie. Um, and then his big motorcycle bike jump off the base jump, I thought was more exciting with him and Henry Cavill falling out of the plane in, in Fallout. So I just, I didn't feel like it even topped the franchise, let alone, you know, do something completely original. Sean, to your point, though, with that, because if this because Jake just mentioned that we kind of had the sense that the next one might be the last one, like that was the thing that they had said. Yeah. Wouldn't it be it would you would sort of enjoy that more if you were like, oh, this last film is going to be they're going to they're going to pay homage. Yeah, of, of, of they're going to try to elevate it to modern standards or whatever. And that could be a cool way to find a way to thread all that. But knowing that he's just going to keep doing it, it's like, okay, well then I agree with you. It feels very much like a rehash versus uh, finding a way to honor the franchise in a, in a, in a full circle way. Yeah. Gabe, you also brought up a really good point before we started recording, which is just like, I do feel like there were just a little bit too many peaks behind the curtain oh. of how things were done before I saw the movie. I, so I really hope for oh, part two, you know, I, I would like for there to be, some stunts that maybe I don't even know about. And I get that the stunts are the sell, but I, I feel like, um, you know, this, especially, you know, the, the big showcase of riding off of there, there was, and granted there are a lot of shots and a lot of aspects to that sequence that, that I didn't know in advance going in since then, I feel like I have seen them in, in a lot of promotional material, but like they just show too much. But, to, but didn't even the jump itself, like it's one thing to kind of it, it deflates the jump itself because you're like, well, I've seen this footage and now it just has a CG cliff on it. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. I've seen these shots. They released it. But it also for the, I don't know, maybe it's a 10 minute scene before that. Maybe it's only five, but maybe it's a 10 minute scene of Benji sort of, I, you're, trust me. Yeah, you're going to get there. And all of that, there's no buildup. All the buildup that that scene is designed to do is mm -hmm. deflated because I go, well, he's on the bike. That's the cliff from the thing. I'm just waiting for for Ethan yeah. Hunt to realize that he's going to run off a cliff when I already yeah. know it. And mm. why would you want to take that away from your audience for something that Tom Cruise risked his life to do? Like, could, mm. could you imagine if before Ghost Protocol, they released a 30 minute how he walked on the edge of the Burj Khalif before I mean, seeing it? I, I listen, I think that these Th these I love these videos um, and I understand what you all but are release saying them after release them after is all I'm saying. Well, I will say this. So we know he's going to do a stunt like they've already they've already put in the work to so that we know he's going to do a stunt. We in terms know. of showing stuff like, no, like lead everyone us up knows. to the moment. Like, like we all know he's going to do. Yeah, I agree with Gabe. We all know he's going to do these things. So like, you know, maybe in the clips moving forward, you get us all the way until he does the thing and then cut off before it. Like to the point where it's like, look, if you want to see him do the thing, you got to buy a ticket. But they do this for every one of the movies. I, see, I feel like three, we three I, three I feel like. I feel like Dude, Fallout, look, maybe I just didn't see as much going into. I don't know why. I feel like Fallout, like I, there was a lot of stuff that felt really fresh to me. I, I don't disagree with the idea of what Gabe is saying. I mean, there is no, there's nothing, there's, there, he's not wrong. I mean, as I'm watching the build up to the bike scene, we know where the bike scene is coming and we, yeah. we get it. And, and he's not wrong. Um, the stunt is a, a payoff. It's like having, it's like having something spoiled. The stunt sure. is the payoff. But I, I see to me, like, I don't, that doesn't take away from the experience to me like I, like with all the mission films like i've to me actually those enhance it for me i i, I love but, but i'm also somebody who's obsessive behind the scenes that's you know as i mentioned with nolan stuff i i watch all those featurettes and everything i love that kind of stuff but, but, okay think, but, but you did you didn't watch that truck flip featurette before you saw the dark knight right no, but that, but that's different. I mean, in this in it, with mission, I've come to understand that my mission experience is going to come with featurettes. But but that's my point. Though. It. That's my point. Like, why would we accept to have a lesser experience in the theater when they're going to go through all this hard work to make it immersive? I don't and, think most people the watch audience. those featurettes that that we I, I, like film Twitter. We tweet them out. Like my mom and dad. Oh, until I until I aired my interview with Tom Cruise probably had not ever seen that behind the scenes That's footage. Funny. And funny. I, 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 I will say this though, I get a lot I got a lot of messages. I get a lot of messages from people who when I put out my interview with Tom Cruise about the motorcycle jump that said I wasn't going to see this, but now I am. Hmm. 
I think there's Fine. a there's that's a, a really small sample size. The video that they sure. released six months ago showing you every shot from the scene has 14 million views on it. That's 200 like, 14, like that, that's 200 million dollars worth of tickets. Is my 10 point. million of them are me though to be to be honest. It's fair enough. I, all me. I'm yeah. saying it's is also worldwide. I just, <laughs> I just think that that's I just think that it's weird to 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 undercut something that you spend so much time on. I Whenever, get it. like when they announce, if they were to say like, "Oh, he's going to jump off a cliff with a motorcycle," and just say it, we still have sure. the, we still have our imagination to lead us there. Yeah. With this one in particular, they released stills of them on the train, and everyone was excited of like, "Holy shit, they're going to ride a train and have a fight on a train!" Like that was great. So maybe let me tell far. you, let me let me give, give you my reason why I think Dead Reckoning o- oversold their stunts going into this because sure. their story sucks. Yeah. <laughs> the story is not good. Um, yeah. It's it it really it relies way too heavily, even for a mission movie um, on chasing a MacGuffin, which happens to be these two keys that, that can fit I mean, together. To be fair, all mission movies are chasing a MacGuffin. A hundred percent. I think that this one has nothing else in it beyond chasing the MacGuffin. I think there in the other ones, while there but, is a MacGuffin to be chased, there's other okay. things at all play. Right. Well, more interesting the, character development, more interesting, uh, you know, a, a better villain to go after something yes. more powerful than the entity, you know, and are we going to get to these keys before we figure out how it goes down? This film suffers from, a, in my opinion, a bad script. And and, I, I, and at the end of the day, I I'm sure people come after you and go, well, it's an action movie, Kevin. It's not supposed to have a phenomenal script. I disagree with that 100%. Um, I think that three, four, five, and six are great examples of films that had good scripts, good stories, and things that I was invested in. This film, and I talk a lot about exposition on this show, um, and I think it's a really important thing to bring up because there are filmmakers who do it well and filmmakers who don't do it well. Macquarie does exposition well. He has done it well in the past. But there are literally scenes in this movie where it kind of reminded me of that uh, of Doctor Strange when when Patrick Stewart, Sir Patrick Stewart and everybody showed up and everybody was finishing each other's lines. Um, there's a moment in this film where they're explaining the, 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 the plot and the story. It's early on. They're like in a boardroom. Um, it was before the green smoke goes off. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and listen, the minute that that dude walked into that room, I said, oh, that's Ethan Hunt wearing a mask. And, and I think immediately, my immediately. problem with a scene like that and for people who haven't seen it or when you do see it, Every single person in that in that in that scene is finishing the per- other person's sentence perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like if I were to say today is going to be a good day, the sky is blue. I would say today is Sean would go good day and whatever, and then and, and it would just go like that. And to me, it didn't feel like a realistic conversation. And I'm not saying that these movies have to be hyper realistic, but there's something to but mission exposition. Has been. That's that's like mission has felt yeah. grounded. And I don't mean to disparage something you love and I, I don't like doing it this way, but I think people will get what I'm saying where this felt less mission and more campy fast and furious. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing is like, like I, and I, I'll be the first to admit, I love fast and furious, but I understand that those scripts aren't the greatest scripts in the planet. Right. I, I just you love expect those characters. something different. Right. Yeah. I expect when I'm watching fast and furious and I'm watching Vin Diesel drive down the side of a dam in his car <laughs> while there's an explosion happening, <laughs> I am fully invested in that because of the ridiculous nature of it with, with <laughs> when you're watching a mission film, Regardless of how insane the stunt is, they're still grounded. It's still grounded in a in a in a real real world reality situation that I don't believe is winking at the audience. It's trying to it's trying to keep you in a serious notion. All right. um, what's the what, last thing I'll say about this is this. The stunts are great. The action's great. I actually think the Rome car chase scene's incredible with Haley Atwell. I think the train scene's incredible. Um I also think the bike jump is amazing. I love the way it was fit into the narrative. Um, I think one of the best scenes in the film is actually early on in the airport yeah. when there's no action. It's just, it's just straight just up chase. dialogue. Oh, it, felt, it felt very um, Mission Impossible 1. It felt like that, 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 that felt very to And there are a lot of aspects of this movie that feel yeah, very to The city, the night city stuff felt Even very, with yeah, all yeah. of his, his cantered angles, I thought yeah, this yeah. was Macquarie trying to do one. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and, it, and it fit having, yeah. I can't remember the actor's name, having the, the character back himself. Like he shot, Kendrick? he did that. Yeah. And yes. Gabriel. He, yes. He had that shot that I think is very yeah. famous from, from that like diner or whatever they yeah. are with the gum that he sticks on the, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also like, that looked just like and the palms, like hallway fight was like a, like a wet, 
sort of European look yeah. that that De Palma had in his first one. Like, yeah. I think a lot of it's an homage to the first one. Also, there's some really cool. I mean, there, again, there's there's there is a lot in this movie I did love. Like, there's an amazing bridge fight sequence with Rebecca Ferguson, and, and you know that I thought was incredible. And ah, I that thought, felt out of place to me. That's interesting. You feel that way though. I like that scene. I think just from a filmmaking standpoint, I just think it looks really sure. like beautiful. Um, but I think at the end of the day, this film just suffers from a bad script. Yeah, it's they. I can't tell you how many times I started getting aggravated when they would say the entity. They mm. must have said the entity. I don't even know 50 times and I, and, and, and I get the, I will give Chris McQuarrie credit for writing a film like this or three years or whatever ago. And considering where we are now with AI, it, it is very prescient and very interesting that, it, that it, it, it does play a villainous aspect in the movie. It's just not interesting. The villain isn't interesting. And I think at the end of the day, it's going through the motions of a mission film. It's almost like, how can I explain it? When I was watching it during the action scenes, I was like totally engaged. And then they would jump out of an action scene and go into full dialogue sequences and it would completely lose me. And I think that's what this one does wrong versus what the other ones did right. The sequences in between the action need to be as engaging and as intense as the action because the action should, should service that narrative. This would just became like almost like a theme park ride. I was like, OK, here we go again. I'm getting back on the coaster. Here's a cool sequence. And then the ride stops and then I get in line again. And then that's kind of what it felt like. And, I, and I, I think it is worth seeing because there are some incredible action scenes. But I did feel the film felt a little lifeless to me, Jackie, in a weird way. Yeah, I mean, I gotta be honest, I, I still very much had a great time watching it. Um, yeah. I, I also recognize, yeah, like there were moments of bad exposition and there were moments where like it could have been, you know, 20 minutes tighter. But at the end of the day, like I still think that the uh, mission uh, series as a whole does not feature a bad installment. I don't think that there is a bad mission film. I think, you know, no pun intended, I think it's impossible to keep up the track record it's at. And unfortunately, like yeah. coming off of the last mm -hmm. three, even four mission movies, inevitably one was going to take a dip. It's just going to happen. Yeah. Um, I would have loved ask you guys a very important question. I don't mean to cut you off, Jake, because I, I, I think this is a question that, that I feel like would would Def define the conversation. Do or would you, you say that we have to answer the question if we choose to accept the question? <laughs> no, no. I, I want Jake to finish this point. But do you, when this movie ended, were you genuinely excited to see where the story would go next? Well, that, that was just about what I was about to say. Is I was I'm a little amazed that the for for it being part one of two that it didn't really feel like much of a cliffhanger right. ending. Like it really kind of felt like it was pretty tidy cleaned up. Right. And then with, you know, uh, the, the string being what, that, that they don't know that they've got to go down to the submarine like that. Well, like and the, the, the thing that you're yeah. waiting to find out is not interesting. So it was like, no. it was kind of a hollow cliffhanger of like, still right. don't really know what the entity is or what, how that works. And it's like, I, is I, it, is it possible that when we see two and also, I mean, don't forget and look, this is an excuse for, for lackluster scripts or whatever. And, and, and I feel like we've been bashing this movie a lot, despite the fact that like, I mean, I give it a seven it. out of 10. Like I feel, yeah. I feel like we've been focusing a lot on, on the negative of this movie. Um, don't forget this movie was the victim of a lot of starts and stops uh, courtesy of COVID. Like this, this movie was riddled by COVID delays mm -hmm. um, and, and an inflated More budget because of right. COVID, you know, more time to get it wrong um you know it's it's you know so i look i'm not making excuses for it but and, and and yes it is it is the weaker of of the past few um but at the end of the day if you can be a bottom three of a franchise with seven movies so far and still be pretty damn good yeah i, I just have a hard time like calling yeah. that a bad I film or a disappointment. Know, but we're, uh, we're spo Sean, we're spoiled though. Sean, if you actually think about it, we're spo to Jake's point, we're spoiled by the last four or five missions, right? Sure, like, it was inevitably going to come they, back down to earth. But they've been extraordinary. But like, I'm surprised three, four, that it was McHugh at the helm. I agree. If it was a different, if it was Louis Leterrier, guest of the show, I love him. If there was a, a director replacement and this happened, I would be like, ah, it makes a little more sense. 
but it was a good point still so no you're right can i say say one thing really quickly Uh, i interviewed rebecca ferguson for silo earlier this year and she made a comment that really kind of makes sense after having seen this film that sort of implies that they're kind of making the script which obviously they make the script up but like they're making the script up as they go along she told me how like she'll be on set and she'll ask wait McHugh, am i running left or right and he'll basically say well just run both ways and then we'll figure out what we're doing in the edit so they're (laughs) very much seems to be a degree of like they're kind of i don't want to say they're making it up on the day no 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 listen i just wrote about this fallout when fallout started rolling cameras they had a 33 page script and an outline of where wow. they're going to go. And for people that who are listening, eventually gladiator. that's going to catch up with you. They have a gladiator. They had like a 16 page script and then they just made it up. And McQuarrie says that uh, to him, the mission movies have taught him that he needs to be reactive to wh- what the story needs. So mm. he follows it. Um, and it's worked for him to a certain extent. <laughs> I feel like in this one, it didn't really work for him as well as well as it has in the fact do you think that it's because he's thinking of this as part one of two and not a complete film maybe i'm possibly i maybe i'm hopeful i'm left wondering if the uninteresting entity is going to be a rug pull in part two and become more interesting once we get a better understanding because right now i want to believe two has a perspective to make us re-look at one with um, i'm hopeful for that yeah. yeah Yeah, because right now with Barbie and Oppenheimer coming, I think that Paramount should be pretty uh, Christopher McWorried. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, it's going to make a lot of money. Oh, and, and also it, ha- it has the ability to follow. No, I, I, I thought it, I, I thought I thought it was funny. <laughs> I just step all over no. that line. It was brilliant. I, I thought it was funny. No, but in all, in all, worried. <laughs> I know I got it. I, I got it. I, I just it was funny, Sean. <laughs> We will be back next week reviewing uh, both Oppenheimer and Barbie in full. We also if are going to have, a tease as for mentioned, you, how, for how batshit crazy next week's going to be. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Tomorrow, next week's going to be nuts. We uh, also have a thirty-minute interview next week with Greta Gerwig. We a do thirty. Yes, we do. Minute interview. Jake and I wore pink suits. Yep. And it's hilarious to sit across from Greta wearing those pink we didn't suits. Plan it. That's and hilarious. please, please subscribe I've to our seen YouTube the footage. channel. I've seen the footage and somehow you both managed to match the shade of the pink at the, in the yeah. set. Pretty What's remarkable. really funny about that is when I bought that suit, because Jake and I didn't plan it. When I bought that suit, I thought it wasn't pink enough. <laughs> it and was then perfect. when we sat down in that chair and I will say people listening to us subscribe to the YouTube channel because um, Greta gives us a really cool tour of the room and there's a camera in the room that was used in the film, also, um, which is really cool. So I can't emphasize enough how happy I was to not be at that interview for this reason Why? alone, for this reason alone. You two look fantastic in your pink suits, <laughs> and I would have looked like the, I have, gr- like the grimace shake challenge. <laughs> please, between you two. please Photoshop. It would have been Sean into that. Sean, can I say something? And there, you know that I, you know that I love you. I do. Know I you love me. saw the photo of the two guys sitting yeah. next to each other, yep. and I said, you know, I'm kind of glad Sean wasn't there because he would <laughs> he wouldn't have dressed up in a pink suit. It would have looked so It would have looked so weird. I would have screwed up that dynamic <laughs> so. Badly. <laughs> no, I believe me. That's the exact. That's the first thing I thought of was, boy, why I'm glad I'm not there because I would not have. Why did we wear pink suits to Nolan? We should have I mean, worn we three all pink wore suits black to suits, Nolan. But, but yeah. really, it would it wouldn't have worked. It worked so well with you two. It looked you should, perfect. You should have wore your pink suits to Nolan and then and then said, "We're seeing Barbie right after this." You, Barbie. you know when Foley, uh, when uh, um, Chris Farley tries on that coat in a coat, Tommy boy. <laughs> Fat guy. And all right. So in the YouTube comments, uh, head down below and let us know. Listen, here's the challenge. All right. We've been talking about this all episode. Now I want to hear from you guys. If you can only see one movie in July, Mm. what movie are you choosing and why? I'll give you guys a couple of options. Obviously, easy. We just reviewed Mission, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Haunted Mansion, Insidious is still currently in theaters. Uh, what's what's TRD? Th- what's TRD? The, the Red Door. Oh, Insidious, oh, the Red yeah. Door. Yeah. 
Also, if you haven't yet seen Indiana Jones and things like that, uh, if you can only see one movie in July, which one would you go see and why? Head to the uh, YouTube comments down below. Just so you know, Larry Crown is a perfectly acceptable option. Going back to theaters, from what I understand. Yeah, there's some local theater that's probably showing that. <laughs> in IMAX. Yeah, they're releasing Larry Crown in 70 millimeter IMAX. In the meantime, um, next Greta, week. That scooter feels like well, it's just scooter. driving right through the theater. <laughs> Wait to hear that sound Jake, design. Jake bought a 3D TV just so he could watch Larry Crown in 3D at home. Just skip it's, that. Look, he's back at school. It's like I'm there with him. <laughs> it's the 4DX, but you're riding on the scooter. <laughs> the, the wind is hitting you. It's, it's the whole thing. Julia Roberts' arms hold on to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jake's track. not Jake's not actually uh, holding the handlebars. He's got a little scooter, but he's he's got a fake uh, Tom that he's straddling in the back yeah, yeah. of the bike. <laughs> Come on, Tom, let's go back to community college. <laughs> All right, back. We'll be back next week. Follow us on social media at Jake's Takes at Kevin McCarthy TV at Sean underscore O'Connell at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. What do we shout now? I don't even know what to shout. The Oppenheimer, it's not here yet. Oppenheimer. Yeah, man. It hasn't I'm gonna yet. say I'm gonna say Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, that's a good one. Because I, I want to dream big. Napoleon, the man who moved the earth. Killers of the Flower Moon.